Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 89. This episode is Kevin Thompson, who is not only a Grammy-winning producer, but also just a really cool dude. And I'm pretty sure I broke the record for saying that's so cool uh, the most in an episode. But you know what? With somebody like Kevin, with his caliber of stories and all the cool things that he's done, it's kind of warranted. It's kind of warranted. Uh, we talk about all kinds of stuff, how he got into audiobooks, um, how many productions he's done for Audible. It's insane. If you're listening to this, you most likely are familiar with his work. Um, it's amazing. We talk about how he uh, got involved. We talk about his animated series he did for MTV. We talk about that pitch meeting and how crazy that was. Different weather that we've been in. We talk about working with Betty White. I know. You heard that right. Betty White. Kept making breakfast for Kelsey Grammer. Working with Kobe Bryant. Fascinating, fascinating what Kobe Bryant's doing these days. And then we talk about uh, his passion project called the Red Trunk Project. It is one of the coolest things I've ever heard. And that's not hyperbole. The fact that he he's changing the world. And I love talking to people who have a heart for that kind of stuff. And uh, Kevin is very much one of those. So on top of just doing the coolest stuff you can think of for a job, he also started this Red Trunk Project, which is... It's going to be big. It's going to be really, really big. It's very important work. I highly recommend you check out the Red Trunk Project. It is at redtrunkproject.org. Um, by the end of this, you're definitely going to want to get involved. Um, check that out. Without further ado, let's uh, let's get done with me talking. Let's do this. The Interesting Podcast, episode number 89 with Kevin Thompson. Theme song time. <laughs> I was always amazed at how tunnels are built because as a kid, I I didn't understand that the tunnel's not like in the water because, you know, the water level, obviously, you're it's not going to. Yeah. So learning right. that, I was like, what? It's crazy. Like the tunnels, tunnels that go into the city, like the Lincoln Tunnel and the Holland Tunnel. Yes. Um, yeah. That's always kind of scary. There's no, there's no earthquake, so it hasn't been for a long time, but that would be kind of scary to be caught in a tunnel. Oh, you know? man. Yeah. Can you imagine? Have you been in an earthquake? Oh yeah, I lived in California for a few, quite a few years. Is it weird? I've never been in one. Oh yeah, it's 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 well, like like little ones are like just like oh my god, the house is shaking. Like like a, a couple <laughs> of really big trucks went by the house, right? Yeah. And then um, bigger ones are like, oh, the house is swaying like it's liquid. Oh, That's my really god. weird. That's so weird. Our house, yeah. the, so houses are they made differently to be able to withstand that, or they're just. They just roll the dice. Uh, a lot of them, yes. A lot of them are wood frame because they because they can they can take the stress. Right. It's more of a um, some some don't or like stone. I mean, now pretty much anything in California has to be built, especially big buildings. You know, earthquake code. Right. Right. That's such a weird thing, especially like living in Florida my whole life to imagine earthquakes. But then I people probably feel the same way about hurricanes, and I'm like, eh, you know, it's hurricanes. They just happen. Yeah, like tornadoes. Yeah, like fires, mudslides, yeah. riots. Yeah, Tor tornadoes are the scary ones. Those like happen instantly. You got no time to prepare, and then they can like take your house. Uh, um. Well, a, a lot of time you'll have time to prepare because you'll 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 they 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 know pretty well, you know, and then the, the tornado sirens coming before the tornadoes hit, so you have some time. But and you can also often like see them off in the distance coming at you. Oh my God! Quick, Dorothy. Yeah, you know, yeah. sometimes um, they, yeah, they, they just pop up o over your house and you're you're kind of screwed. But yeah, right. I want to know you, what kind of belt Bill Paxton had on. Yeah, how do you feel about language in your podcast? Oh, language? by all means, my friend. Okay. Yeah, there's no. I uh, get a little comfy. You know, it's much better. No, seriously though, tornadoes, tornadoes are nuts. I, have you been a tornado? I've never been one of those either. Yeah, sort of. I lived in, in West Texas when I was a little kid, and yeah, there was one, one time a tornado came and kind of ripped, ripped part of the roof off our house. What? Like some shingles and stuff. Yeah, not much. While you were in it? And there was a flood. I was in a flood. 
Oh my um, I've never really been in a hurricane. I've been. Oh, I've been in those. Yeah, though those. Well, you know, you, you're 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 in Naples, right? Yep. Yeah, so you're in the safe. You're in the safe coast. Yeah. So exactly, Miami is the one that gets hit until two years ago when Irma hit. Because when I came out your side, yeah. Yeah, and that was a weird thing because there was like the. It kept switching every day. It was like Thursday, it's going to hit Miami, and then Friday, it's going to hit Naples. It's going to hit Miami, going to hit Naples. And then they didn't give mandatory evacuation until like 24 hours before it hit us because we kept thinking it was going to hit Miami. So when it Did hit you... us, it was like, no, I didn't evacuate because we're like, oh, it's going to hit Miami. So we like we got hit with a really strong – it was a Category 4 when it hit, but the second it made landfall like four miles from where I was, it was a Category 3, bumped down just enough. And it was weird because we were in the eye of the hurricane for a little bit. So you had this like massive oh. storm and trees flying everywhere and really loud. And through the windowsill, you can hear like of the wind. And oh. then it was just dead quiet for like a half hour. And we're like, what? It's crazy. Get back inside. <laughs> yeah. Nuts. That's amazing. Crazy. And like the week before, it was like Mad Max out there because all the gas stations got emptied because people were like, we're all going to die. And food yeah, that, was sparse. That... Crazy. Ridiculous. That happened in, um, I was in the Outer Banks, God, dozen years. That's where I'm from. Oh, okay, whereabouts? Uh, there's a place called Elizabeth City right there. That's where I was born, in North Carolina, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, those Outer Banks. Yeah, we were, we were near Duck or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know where Duck is. Really yeah. nice. And suddenly, oh, my God, there's, there, there was a hurricane somewhere way far south, and then when you, everyone used up all the gas. Loaded up everything, just gas cans. Yep. So the lines, and it's ridiculous. It was nuts. We hit, there was one weather guy that was on TV, and he's like, you need to leave, because if you don't, you're all going to die. And then he paused, and he goes, and your kids will die, too. We're like, is this on TV happening? It was bonkers. Yeah. People were panicking. They're, they're building in, um, I was in Galveston, and I, I've got a half-brother's kind of fiancé works for, in Austin, for um, a uh, um, communications kind of firm, marketing PR, and they, they're doing some work with... Uh, there's a huge um, infrastructure project in Galveston. They're building a huge seawall or sea walls. Oh, sweet! Um, for like you know, for hurricane and, and and you know all that kind of storm surge stuff because the um, refineries are right there. Oh, so, right. Galveston and 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 the irony, of course, is that all these these super storms caused by climate change. Yeah, uh, and it's the gas industry wanting to protect themselves. Yeah, <laughs> irony is so thick. It's just, yeah. You can't write that stuff. No, um, oh, man. Galveston, yeah. California, Outer Banks. You've been all over, man. Yep. Where you? Where are you from? I'm uh, born in Texas. Oh, really? What part? Dallas, Midland, seven years. Right then on. Moved, then moved to England. Lived in London. What? <laughs> That's very different. Very different, and then moved to Berkeley, California. After that, now it's going to get completely all three completely different. Dude, completely for, for work different. or your dad was military or um, um, oil, and then um, a uh, a divorce. Fair, fair. And then, and then my mom moved back to Berkeley back when Berkeley had like the best school system in the country, right? System, and then Prop Thirteen hit and took all the money out of the schools, and mm -hmm. um, still a great time. Berkeley was a lot of fun in the seventies. Oh, and, I bet. School in North Carolina. Yeah. My New York. Home. Yeah. But uh, Winston-Salem, though, not not like further uh, further inland. Right, 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 right. So then when did your interest in entertainment start? Um. Oh, God, early. Yeah. Oh, like eighth, eighth grade, ninth grade, through high school, the theater. And then um, I worked, uh, I would do a deal at tech theater, and then, then my senior year switched over to like acting and directing, and then... Um, Worked as an uh, an apprentice at the Berkeley Berkeley Rep. Cool. For high school, I was spending a year doing that, and I spent two years as an apprentice at a theater um, called Pacific Conservatory of Foreign Arts down in um, Santa Maria, and then went to school for four years, BFA program, North Carolina School of the Arts. Dude. Um, and then, but a lot a lot of time, like you know, a lot of Shakespeare festivals and other shit through all all through there, and then um, moved to New York. Um, um, we had a, had a pre school presentation like the end of my senior year. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of interest from a lot of people. Like sixteen agents wanted to sign me and all this kind of stuff. And wow, lots of this and that. And do, I was flying up and doing soaps before I graduated. What? Um, 
testing for stuff and uh, meeting Al Pacino, all kinds of weird, you know. I, I auditioned for, um, I went in and, and um, I, I, I flew up for um, a couple of days and my agent says, um, you're going in for, you're meeting uh, whatever, whatever at Warner Brothers, mm-hmm. auditioning for a new movie called The Princess Bride. Oh. Said, oh, really? <laughs> really? And but by this time, I had read the book. Right. And when I was a huge fan of the book and a huge fan of William Goldman anyway, and, um, I'm like, wow, okay. And uh, went in and the, um, I guess I'd gotten the sides, maybe I had the sides like right then. Mm-hmm. And rereading for, for Wesley, The Man in Black. What? And, uh, and the casting director starts to explain explain the book to me. Oh. You know, I'm, <laughs> You're like, please. I, I got, I got, I got. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, man, but I, yeah, I, I think I got this. Yeah, and, <laughs> so, it, it obviously did not happen, and Carrie Elvis got it, and he was perfect for it. So, yeah, that's nuts. I'm into uh, the right age, right age. So, it was being an actor something that you wanted to do right out the bat? And when were you like, mm, I'm try directing? Well, I, I, I didn't really. I never. I mean, I, I kind of. I liked theater. I liked actors. Liked all that kind of stuff. I didn't. I didn't really. Um, like perform, I didn't have that. I gotta have to perform or I'll die kind of bone. Right. I, I was I was, meant, I was meant to, and this uh, this started in high school. I was meant to like g- do, learn acting, kind of, kind of cause that seemed like kind of the basis, and then like, but like you know, and then write and direct. Right. And do. So that, that's kind of where I wanted to head. And pretty much right after I got to New York, I'm 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 auditioning. I'm doing you know soaps. I'm I'm regional theater, but I found a writing partner, and we started writing screenplays. So this is like. Like nine months into, into landing here, and 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 it got to, and then some guys got some commercial agents, and I'm going up a lot of commercial stuff, and I'm like, really, I have to, you know, I'm 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 writing, I have to really, <laughs> yeah. And, um, I the acting kind of dropped off after a, a few years, and I got more into writing, and then um, I started writing for. There was like a um, the, the the Roger Corman of the East Coast. I mean Chuck Vincent. I started writing for him, like like in house screenwriter and uh, oh, also cool. acting. And then, um, but like you know, I'd, I'd, I'd blow out a science fiction script in a couple of weeks and go on to the next little you know um, mistaken identity comedy thing, whatever triple trouble, and then you know on to the next thing, the, the limo driver, you know romance thing, and on the next, and right. uh, and then 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 writing downtown comedy stuff, and then. Kind of fell sideways into audiobooks. I was I was I was um, rewriting a hard copy because you know no, I my, I actually had at one point a portable computer this was before laptops existed. Oh, uh, what? And it was it was a Zenith portable computer. It was it must have weighed 10, 20 pounds. Oh my uh, god! You had you had big the big floppies the big well, whatever size in the, not those small floppies the big floppies. Oh yeah, the like had plates. <laughs> you had to boot the thing up with DOS. Oh right? my god! With floppies and then and then and then put the Microsoft Word, MS Word floppy in to get that going. <laughs> you couldn't save anything. There was no hard drive basically on the computer, right? So everything had to be saved on 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 floppy disks. Right. And it was a piece of crap. It kept crashing. The guy Chuck Vincent ended up leaving the business, moved down to Florida, Fair. and owed me like you know two three grand, and said, "Oh, just just keep the laptop. I mean the the portable, the computer." Oh no, <laughs> the rock. Play. Oh god, you know. And I should have kept it because it would have been just a relic, and people would have said, "What the hell is that?" Right, right. It was the size of. Um, like a, a like like a, a laptop, the same kind of um, footprint, but six inches high. It's like a mini microwave. Yeah, kind of. Um, it was just not not quite that big. But anyway, anyway, that that's insane. Uh, yeah, and then uh, kind of fell sideways into audiobooks, and then um, for a guy who used to work for Cadman, I was I was in a cafe in the village in New York where where I had a hard copy editing um rewriting a screenplay and he goes oh and we get in a conversation and um he was actually looking for writers for uh, um 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 a short sub a short um material project and, and i said oh mysteries and things and we got talking and and then he was looking for investors and he had family that had a lot of money and um ended up not happening and then he got pulled back in the and he was at that point kind of unemployed but he had family money didn't have to really work sure. but then he 
then to Time Warner um, was kind of launching Time Warner audiobooks, which was Warner Music and Warner Books, um, and had tons of, of money. They they had a whole floor in in Beverly Hills. What? Building on Sunset. They had they had a composer on staff. They were just throwing money around. Good lord! Good person he was, to have in your corner. He was hired as an East Coast producer, and then I was kind of brought in to be a freelance guy to work with him, and um, just almost like my first project was no I, I did a couple of small things we did we did a um a magic school bus i, I did an adaptation oh, what or like that was like the second thing i did and that was nominated for a grammy dude and that uh, it did not win uh the lion king won and then i ended up just doing a ton and then and almost immediately after that i did a huge um um multicast version of um, Tales of the Jedi, a dark. Oh yes, I read it. And uh, we died. It was adapted. I, I It was like God, two or three hours long. Twenty five actors doing twenty five characters. Well, not a lot of some doubling, but not a lot. Uh huh. So the the additions were just. I mean, it was insane. And then I did the um the original trilogy um on um the um the the four five and six episodes the mm-hmm. books. Of, which had never been done on audio, those novelizations. And then just tons more, and lots of other stuff, and James Patterson, lots of other books and things. And and, it was, and then back then, not everything was done on audio, just kind of the big bestsellers and things they knew would sell. Right. And um, there was a lot more, um, it was great, it was a lot more fun, a lot more experimentation, working with a binaural microphone, all kinds of cool stuff. And then... Uh, that went on for, I guess, five or six years. And then I, I um, had a friend at MTV Animation. I ended up pitching to her. They were looking for ideas. I said, I think I, I, I of an idea for a cartoon. And came up with something and pitched it. And they bought it. And we made 13. And uh, they aired oh. six. And then it was, it, was, it was a kind of a global spy thing. I was writing to spies. So yeah, why not? That was great. And then... Um, I then went back and then of course went back to audiobooks and I started working for Random House. There you go. Because all the Star Wars stuff I'd done and then tons of DC Comics stuff as well. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, um, lots of um, um, top movie tie-ins, um, novelizations, uh, and then I was also I was also shunting me into like doing all the voice stuff for video games, some toys, so online animation stuff. And then I guess the DC stuff continued going a little bit, maybe, after I got back from the cartoon, and then started working for Random House, um, doing all kinds of Star Warsy and stuff, and I've been doing it ever since. That's crazy. The past like that go. Work begets work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Work is work. What? So then I've always wondered, what is it like writing, like for other people, like on a show or in a writer's room and stuff like that? Like, how does that process even work? Um, well, it's, it's, wasn't writing, well, I mean, um, like, like at, um, MTV? Yes. That was, that was, we, they gave us, we had way too much freedom. Oh. <laughs> we, had, we had way too much, I mean, it's. Just let you go. Had, oh, no, yeah, literally, we, they, they would, legal would look at a script after we did it, but they wouldn't say anything. The only, only comment we got was, because we, the show was about these two spies running around the world. Mm-hmm. And there were some set characters within that world, but a lot of a lot of cameos. We would just you know just drop in celebrities. All oh, this like for like literally a, 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 a half second, just cut to of Heidi Klum or whoever, Ben Affleck or just whatever. Cause. Just why not? Just, just, <laughs> just name dropping. Just you know, boom, because and then that and it was it was it was done ironically and right. making, you know not really make kind of making fun of the world of glamour and all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. and. Um, in one of the last episodes we had we put Carson Carson Daly in something perfect and um, they said don't do that <laughs> it something like him it was an episode like Christina Aguilera was in or something and they said oh you know there's there's history there or something you you can't you can't take Carson out We're like oh that's the one note you gave us out of all of them in thirteen episodes I that's mean we so we, we had we had there was an episode in, in Brazil with the um. They're down. The, the spies are down. They're like looking. It was very kind of um, 
Uh, what was the um, um, Al Pacino? My little friend. It, it, was, it was a lot, a lot of stuff taken Scarface. from that. Scarface. Yeah. And but but the the um, the milieu was coffee. Oh. Instead of drugs, it was all coffee, and coffee is a metaphor <laughs> for drugs. And um, the two spies were, were pretending to work for a huge American coffee conglomerate called Futbuckers. <laughs> Futbuckers, I love Futbuckers, yeah. and, it was, and they never said a word. Not a note. <laughs> but Carson Daly, dude, that's that's. Yeah. Don't touch that. But don't touch Carson Daly. You can make fun of anybody else. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh my God. So when did is I know, what shows, I know what shows you get like ordered stuff was 13, a number you had in mind or 13 is what you get. Like I'm fascinated by well, how 13, this works. 13 is a standard order. That that's, it's a small order. 20, you know, usually like 25, 26 is kind of a, but now it's like, but it's changed. I mean, now because of like Netflix and all that, right. Like the British are usually, it's usually a six episode. Yep. Right. And then it's like 10, 12 is kind of the standard. For your Netflixian stuff, right? Because that's kind of you're not going to make 26 episodes and dump them, right? right? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, um, occasionally eight, um, usually 10, 12, kind of thing. Yeah. So and then the podcast, it and they're like, "We'll take 13." And they wanted 13, yeah, and they, they we made we made 13. They showed six, and they said, "That's enough." Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then I mean. The animation they, they, at that point, MTV had the biggest animation, you know, quote unquote, studio on the East Coast. Right, and that was like Davis and Butthead, Daria time, right? Exactly, Diarrhea. I mean, Daria. <laughs> <laughs> celebrity death match. Was yes, a... celebrity death match. Oh my god, I haven't heard that in forever. They they were they they were. I mean, it was it was two floors at sixteen thirty three Broadway. It was the fiftieth and Broadway uh, in on on the in New York. Two two things down from um, Colbert, or what Letterman at that point, and um, uh, it was and Deathmatch had like they would they would just spread out around the floor and just grab an empty room and just start filming, set a little setup and just start filming, you really? know, yeah, because and they would they would they would shoot all like you know an episode. It would take a long time with that stop motion claymation stuff to right. shoot, you know, ten a minute. And they had to shoot, you know, like 23 minutes. So they would have to shoot all this stuff simultaneously. Oh, man. All these different scenes um, to get an episode done. So much work. So labor intensive. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was that. And then, and then yeah, Dari was going on and like his butt, um, butthead. And we all used the same recording place. And interestingly enough, a little bit of side note. Hey, hey. Um, the actor... Mark Thompson, who does a lot of Star Wars audiobooks, yep, um, played was in Daria, and I think I met him at Sync Sound, where we all, where all the MTV animation shows, recorded and were mixed. Mm. And Mark Thompson played the part of Say it. Kevin Thompson. Yep, <laughs> I love <laughs> it. I love it. He's I, Mark's been I, on the bro- show, and he talked about how great that show was to work on. Oh yeah, and I have a brother named Mark Thompson. Do you really? Yeah, but it's spelled differently. I mean, both the Mark and the Thompson are both spelled differently. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God, that's so funny. What are the odds? What are the odds? Um, Mark's an amazing talent. Yeah, oh, dude, Mark's the best. He's amazing. Yeah. So um, so how do you, like, pitching is another thing that's, like, really big in the business to get stuff going. MTV mm-hmm. being the powerhouse that it was at the time, like, how do you pitch something to a network like that and not be intimidated? Um... Well, I, um, I, 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 I knew the, uh, uh, my friend who was, I guess, what was her, she was, um, assistant to the head of development, I guess. Cool. Job. And then, um, I brought, I was actually working with a comedy team at the time Two guy, one guy I went to school with and he had a comedy partner and we pitched, I was working on, on um, I wanted to make a comedy. I was a big fan of theirs. I wanted to make a comedy album of their stuff. I thought this would be kind of cool. Yeah. Help out and be kind of cool. I'm getting in the comedy album business. And um, in the middle of that came the request from my friend to come, to come pitch some stuff. So I said, oh, okay, well, I came up with an idea for those two guys. I just went down, sat down, had a couple of martinis by myself, a little notebook, and came up with the idea. There you and, go. And um, I wrote it up, kind of kind of gave it to him, so you guys want to do this? We'll, we'll do like a live, a little scene, basically. We'll, we'll pitch this live. And I said, sure, yeah. 
couple of comments, and I, I, I cut a little kind of music underscore thing for it. Uh-huh. Um, some Dave Arnold Bond stuff. Love it. And, um, some other kind of cool chill stuff in the late 90s. And then went in and we pitched it to the head of development. He said, this is great. Come back and pitch it to Abby Traculli, the head of animation. We came back and we pitched it. And they said, yeah, let's go to, anim- let's go to animatic. This is great. Dude. And literally that quick. And then we then they we we uh we basically made no no we had God, there's one other step we had to do. We we had we had to make like a CD, which and this is kind of what I did then anyway, um, of like a recording of 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 the pitch fully produced, everything but picture. Oh. And I don't I forgot who that was for, maybe the West Coast or something. And then we did then they did an animatic of that, that first thing to um to to focus group and it did really well. And they said we want thirteen. And that was that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and it was it was yeah, it was uh it was fun. I and I, I I kind of assumed it was gonna be, oh here I go new TV, this is great. Yay. Mike Judge made how much money last year? Oh my god. <laughs> Fifty million dollars. Wow. And then but then just you know, there was a lot of backstabbing and kind of unpleasant stuff and Oh yes. That's, and it, it was it was kind of ugly and I'm like oh I don't, that's not very nice. Mm-hmm. And when you know I said I'm going to go back to audiobooks for a while. It's just because it's kind of you know peaceful and 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 the money's not a lot of a lot different. Yeah. At that point, so um, back to audiobooks I went. Man, so you said like your second project was the Tales of the Jedi like full cast thing. So it was like yeah. having done because I know you've done like stage direction, you've done acting, you've done writing. When mm-hmm. were you like what? What is it about the audio medium that made you want to like dig your heels into that? Um, I don't know. It, it, um, it was there. Um, there. Um, it was. It was. I liked because you you could do it and you could do it really well. You know because the, the, the um you could make the like the best audio possible, and it's it's so much easier once you bring picture into it. It gets exponentially more difficult and expensive that's true and time consuming whereas an audio you can you know you can go from idea to script to recording to editing to mixing and then kind of the qc process that could all happen in two months a month and a half that's true the whole thing no right and you're, done. And, and you're done and you can work on other stuff while you're doing that because you'll have time there'll be gaps in your schedule you can like be working on developing other projects right so usually I would I would often be working on ten twelve things at the same time things I'm just kind of finishing things I'm in the middle of things I'm about to do, what, and you can just kind of keep it all kind of rolling and going and, yeah, that's crazy. Um, whereas like that would be very tough with anything with picture. True. Yeah. True. It's a whole separate sense. You yeah. got camera, you got location, you got crew, you got all this stuff. Whereas the rest you can create. <laughs> It's weird though the the mentality of because I mean coming out of theater it's to have no, absolutely no rehearsal process. Oh Roddy. right, because you just show up. Yeah, you're just showing. You're just like, okay, um, give me your finished performance, go. <laughs> yeah, and, and we're going to sell this, and we're going to we're we're, we're going to sell this for a lot of money. Right. right. So go. It's got to be and, good. Yeah, so actors have to come in prepared or be amazing cold readers or both. And, and have a great voice and the stamina and know how to read and be able to do characters and tell a story. There's a lot of things that go into, you know, the storytelling part of that for the, for the, the acting side of it. Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, I have a nice voice. My mom says that I have a nice voice. And there's now, there's, there's so much being done and so much kind of um, uh, lesser quality stuff being done, I guess, because the market's just kind of anything that has words on it. People are wanting to read out loud and record and try right. to make a deal off of because they can do it in their basement essentially. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, 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 it's, uh, the quality's just gone down. So the, 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 the performance quality and the, um, the technical quality has gone down a little bit here and there. Sure. Sure. Um, which, which is, you know, um, but there's, there's all, it's, it's also forcing everyone you know, who's been doing it for a long time, out of complacency. Oh, we got gotta gotta up our game a little bit. Sure. And everyone, everyone the publishing houses and and everyone involved in it, is kind of having to kick it up a, a bit here and there. 
It's about to be a really fun process as well, being in the booth uh, with the right actors. It can be. Yeah, it can be. It's it's it, it's yeah. It's it it can be. But it all it all depends on on the source material. But how how good the oh, source material true. is. And what it's, you know, now that they're doing every book, it's you're not always working on the best books. Right. Um, Often you are. Often you know. I've I've, I've been lucky and worked on and have worked on some great books. You know, here and there you get a few, you know, le- lesser um, written books. Books you are, you wonder who's who's going to read this, <laughs> right? <laughs> this kind of thing. How do you make this historical thing interesting to listen to, or whatever? Yeah. Oh, and and often often the um, the audio book version will be better, right? Than the written version because you know you can the, an actor can kind of explain it and put tension where there's not tension. You know, make the character more interesting or funny than the characters on the page. Sure. Um, I, I love what you said last time was that, like, when you're looking for somebody to do an audiobook, when they're reading it, it's like they're telling a story at the table as opposed to just reading a book. Yeah. That's really cool. When you, when you, so when you're holding, like, I'm assuming you audition for audiobooks as well, like you would any other role. Um, yeah. There's, um, um, the, the audition process for audiobooks is, um, a lot of times it comes from just, there are people in the business long enough. Oh, just get, you know, whatever, get that guy, get Mike, get sure. Dave, get, John, get, get Karen. Um, a lot of the casting just happens that way. That makes sense. Um, and it's, um, usually they won't need to audition. It's just kind of, oh, they can, they can, you know, you know, okay, they can, they can, they can do that. Yeah. They, they did that. That's close enough. Well, that's exactly the same as that. Right. You know um, what you need and you know, in your role yeah. people, this person can do um, that well. And there are people who, you know, off demos, I guess some work off that. It's, it's, um, it's, uh, I, I mean, that's, it used to be the demos would just kind of go to agents and agents would, you know, kind of call through them and pull people. But for all the reasons you'd want like a voice agent, and they're not looking, and audiobooks is by no means the first thing an agent's looking for. Right, right. They're looking for like, can, can you sell, you know, cat food? That's sure. the first thing. And then, you know, maybe, maybe billboards and whatever. There's you know, narration, like long form narration for TV and then audiobooks, which is kind of kind of, you know, the lowest paying in the voiceover field, just especially as far as time goes. Right. Um, uh, it pays, I think, even less well than radio spots. Really? And uh, so much more I work. Know. I mean, as, as far as far as the time goes, right? It's a lot of work, but it, but also be very satisfying. It, I mean, some people just you know are huge book fans. They they love they love long you know reading. They love audiobooks, or they lo- and or they love books, and it's just kind of it's just right in the middle of their wheelhouse, and they have a good enough voice, and um, off they go. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they are you know kind of break in and. There's just so much being done now because it, it it's not it's all the all the p multiple multiple versions of all the public domain stuff, you know the 45 versions of Sense and Sensibility out there, right? right. Um, and then backlist, and then a lot of times the the contracts are 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 up for like the um, my Jurassic Park had the audiobook for that had been done by Anthony Heal 20 years ago mm-hmm. or more. Um, God, wait, a long time ago, and that's back when they used to pay royalties. Oh, weird. On, oh, yeah, they, yeah, they, they they had a whole different um, setup. And Anthony Heal, God, I mean, rumored was he got a check for like a hundred thousand dollars at one wow. point. Wow. Then, but then, but then the audio rights lapsed, right? So they right. they did the pull from the market, and then someone else a couple years ago recorded a new version of it. So so much to be done sure and, and then people are going back and looking at backlisted stuff backlisted books and, and you know redoing those sure it's time again yeah and and draw and, and doing multiple readers on on books and um there's like different char- like I, some a lot of books are done kind of rashomon where they have different characters different points of view mm-hmm. and so they'll get multiple readers a lot of times that just approaching sense. things differently a little more sound effects bringing coming into it a little more music, yeah, uh, which I've always done tons of. Oh, I uh, know. <laughs> I've done a lot of stuff with original composers, and if I'm you, you've heard a lot of stuff I've done. You've heard, like I'm, I'm assuming the, the Star Wars stuff. Yeah, I've heard those. So John Williams music, but I've done a, tons of stuff with original music. Um, I was, there was like two or three composers I worked with a, a lot back in like the '90s, early 2000s. Um, That's so cool. So how, how much creative freedom do you get when adapting an audiobook? Because you you have the source material, but then to adapt it to an audio bit, like 
How much can you bring to a book? Like, are you allowed? Well, it, you mean like a, just a standard audio audio? Well, something you, you, you know, not not a lot. I mean, there's there's um, with with the Star Wars stuff, there's a, I, I have I have the freedom to cut attributions. If it's now, um, Random House has, um, they they bought Listening Library, which is a ki- a kids label, um, spoken word label. They they purchased again, like, like God, early two thousands, I think. Wow. A guy named and Tim Ditlow's father had started in Connecticut. We used to record like David Niven reading stuff. Um, they were like the you know the 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 best you know, children's um, spoken word company around. They were just amazing and amazing productions. And Tim had, was offered an agent said, Hey, you want the rights to the American rights? Mm -hmm. Um, Because Scholastic didn't want the rights to this book about a young um, sorcerer school. Uh. (laughs) He said, yeah, this is kind of cool. And he got Jim Dale to do the audio version. No, you know what it was? It was it was Scholastic had the rights. Scholastic had the the book rights, and they didn't really have an audio division at that time. I had done some stuff for them for, like the um, I think that's where the Magic School Bus came from. I did the Babysitters Club back in Love back it. in the day, and um, it came from Scholastic, and they because they had no no audio division, and they do now. Yeah, for real. <laughs> the Sorcerer series, they didn't. And he had the rights to, to that, to Harry Potter. Dude. And, and he was gobbled up by Random House. Talk about a gold mine. Yeah, they were like, man. They, yeah, they, 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 they made him personally the richest man in audio. Yeah. In like a day. And then they, and then Random House did all the books. And my point behind that was, I forgot. Creative freedom, how much you're allowed to have. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, 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 but, but anything listening library has to be word perfect. Because, oh. uh, because a lot of kids, and this is true, a lot of people, kids especially, use audiobooks for literacy. Right. They're listening as they're Read reading. Mm-hmm. Right. And so it has to be word perfect, true. or it, it kind of defeats the purpose. So anything listening library is 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 word perfect. I mean, even even as far as down to contractions, or um, like like um, bet you can't, bet you can't. It has to be bet you can't. Right. Right. Um, and again, you know, no, 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 you know, they'll, it's, they will, whatever. Um, but the Star Wars stuff, if it's a listening library, which not a lot of it is, um, but the other stuff, I, 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 I can, I can get rid of attributions, which is, you know, just kind of, it's, if there's a conversation, it's a lot of he said, she said, right. but it's odd because one guy is job of the hut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one person is not. You don't need a lot of attributions because it's obvious who's talking. The same with a, if someone's on a hologram and someone else is named Jar Jar Binks, you don't need a lot of attributions. Sure. That makes you sense. Kind of know. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's kind of the only freedom you really have with, I mean, as far as changing anything. Sure. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot of freedom with, with processing and, and, and special effects and all that kind of stuff. That's pretty cool. Like you get to yeah. pick where the music goes and the sound effects and stuff like Everything. that. Everything. That's cool. Everything. So yeah, what's, the, what's the difference in production from like an audio book to like an audio drama? Is it, a, is it attacked the same way? Um, uh, sort of. I mean, audio, an audio drama, like it, it, that's just, you know, again, exponentially more work. Because sure. that, at that point you are in the world of film and, film and cartoon mm-hmm. without picture. Gotcha, gotcha. But, but 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 even even more so though is that um, in you in 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 if you film and picture that 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 does a that does all the work for you pretty much and and it's just the audio is sweetening the picture for the most part. Right. Sometimes you get a big big crunchy explosion or something or process something or other, but mainly you're, you're, the 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 sound is supporting the picture. In audio drama, there is no picture, so the sound has to do all of the work, which. Um, you start getting, you know, what what kind of rules you're gonna have, you know, when once you open one door, mm-hmm. you have to open all the doors. Right. So you have to kind of pick your rules. When once you hear one set of footsteps, you have to hear all the footsteps. Now, right. You can uh, and and say, well, that's kind of we 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 talk about. I can hear him running at me in those boots. Once you say something, you kind of have to do it. But then you can kind of kind of get rid of that and not do that for every where you're foleying every footstep. 
which can, you know, make your life miserable. Yeah. But then you just kind of, you know, pick your rules and go with those. And, and, and it's, it's in the star Wars universe, it's easy because there's so many iconic sounds. Sure. Um, which you kind of, which is kind of your, the, the basis. And there's a, a lot of design around that. I have a lot of different versions of sounds. Um, the cool. first, the first, um, sound effects we got was for the, for, no, I guess, no, we, we had gotten stuff for Tales of the Jedi. We got a bunch of like lightsaber and the blaster stuff and some creature stuff, but not a lot. Cause none, none of that was, none of that was, um, um, from the uh, more traditional known universe. Cause the Tales of the Jedi is like 3000 years previous. Right. Right. <clears throat> and, um, like we did the, 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 the trail, um, episodes four, five and six, the novelizations of those. Um, we had a huge ask list from from Lucasfilm. Um, it all got pulled. It was all on. It arrived on DAT tape. Oh, Remember? sweet! <laughs> yeah. And it was. Um, and it was. We had like all you know the tons of Jawas and 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 droid noises and the sabers and then the Millennium Falcon, all that stuff, Tie Fighters. Mm-hmm. But we also had like 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 for for the um the job of the hut. They, we, we got the raw recording of the actor in the studio. What? And they're re- then they're recording him um, with the processing on. They weren't processing later. They're processing him in real time. What? You know, ch- ch- so you would hear like, you know, there would be talk like, uh, do, you know, do, you know like, go, oh, blah, blah, blah. like in his normal voice, like, like talking to the director. Oh, okay, I'll do it like that. Yeah. Um, but all the chewy stuff and... Uh, Everything, and then and then as as time has gone on, we we don't we don't we don't ask for for you know more effects for everything, because it, it's kind of the relationship has changed where 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 um what Skywalker would would give us, right um, back then, <clears throat> with the, how how you know how they would be pulled, how would they would they would charge. Now it's a lot more um um user user friendly client. I mean um, um license or friendly. Right. Where you can come up with the list and, and we can get it back. Pretty much everything we ask for. That's cool. Um, especially like the like the new films. We've asked for a lot of stuff. Um for the for yeah, the the Phantom Menace and, and and episodes one, two, and three, that was I've done tie ins for all the movies. Love it. Now at this point. Every and um for Phantom Menace I did we did a we did um I was at that point I is this is still in the nineties. Right. And I guess I had done, um, when did the Phantom Menace come out? Was it nine, 99? 90, 99, yeah. Cause I did, um, for Kid Rhino. Oh. <clears throat> Pardon me, for Kid Rhino. Because I, I, I wasn't working for Random House at that point. Right. I did um, um, uh, um, um, as, an, um, uh, a read-along version, but a, but a, but a cut-down, like, like, like for little kids. Right, and a bridge. And, and a, ju- a junior Jedi kit. And, That's cool. Um, great story about the... Uh, doing the um the read along version is i def- i this we're doing this a year before the film came out came out in the summer or whatever this is a year before this mm-hmm. all very very top secret i couldn't tell anyone what it was uh the movie had already been done pretty much they were still doing insulin post um figuring out some character they they did they like they didn't know what the trade federation guys were going to sound like gotcha um that kind of came in um kind of towards i'm in the middle of post they kind of like i got that we did you know, anyway so i was auditioning people in in person actors a lot of me a lot of my news so i didn't know character voice guys around new york mm-hmm. and say just you know do this do that and um i would say okay this guy just make him sound like yoda They're like what because <laughs> it, it was it was the um, the name of the project was called helicopter rescue that's what the audition was for it's for something called helicopter rescue uh-huh and uh, they go, what? They just, just, <laughs> go, okay. And then um, for Jar Jar Binks, um, and, and that that was the most fun. As I, as I, I'm, I'm gonna, they, they look at what, what does it say? What? I said, I'm, I'm gonna play you something. <laughs> I'm gonna play you something, and make it sound like that. And I would play them in their headphones from Jar Jar Binks, and That's I wish awesome. I videotaped their faces going, what the fuck is that? <laughs> That's different. <laughs> this is a year before anyone ever heard Jar Jar Binks. Sure, we were hungry, you know, and, With and no what? context. <laughs> then we um, we cast the whole thing, 
you know, we got a guy who was doing, you know, Obi-Wan and, you know, the, every, the whole, you know, Watto, the whole thing, right? Yeah. Mix it in um, surround sound in 5.1. Um, I, amazing guy doing the narration, the narrative voice for it, and then sent it off for Lucas for approval. And it came back, <clears throat> great, but why don't, you, why don't you just use clips from, from the actors from the film? It's like, what? So they pulled oh. all, because it was, it was a cut down right, right. Of, of the script, um, like a half hour cut down. And, but all the dialogue was from, had to be directly, you couldn't change anything. It had to be dialogue directly from the movie script. Oh. Um, they sent us all, like, all the clips, right? Uh-huh. And but some of the speeches, like an Obi-Wan speech, might have been like three lines from a two-page scene that we made into one little speech, right? Uh-huh. So, and the clips they would send us would have, like, the first one, first of three sentences would be from production, right, from the set, recorded on the set with all the background stuff going on. The second line would be from an ADR studio, so it's completely clean. Oh. And the third line would be from production. Would be way and louder. We had, no, 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 louder. It's, it's the quality of it, because, I mean, volume is easy to change. It's the quality in the background noise. Oh, right. Because you can't, as opposed to having the, the line by itself. You got to find, you have to take all those three. You basically had to remix the entire program Ooh. in a way and make it all kind of work. It was, uh, yeah, it was fun. <laughs> and, uh, but that, but that, but that, that production, you know, that got a gold record. It's, it, or, I mean, and, and, and normally audiobooks don't, don't are considered for that because they're, the RIAA doesn't consider spoken word. They don't track the numbers like that. Oh, or all, like all the Harry Potter to be platinum by now, probably. Right. But it, I have a gold record on my wall. That's so that. cool. You've also it, got another little something that I'm aware of that may or may not be a Grammy. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was, yeah. <laughs> that was, yeah. Um, years later, that was, um, um, the first one was for Betty White. How cool was that? That was just it, it. It was funny because um, the girl at Penguin, an um, amazing woman named Patty Peruse, did a lot of work with her. She, um, there was um, Chaz Bono, oh, um, Shares, um, son. Mm-hmm. Well, that time daughter, kind of son. She was transitioning, right? And, um, had written a book about her experiences, and there was a Betty White book, and. Um, Patty, who normally just, you know, just a signed project. She was a publisher at the at Penguin Audio. And, um, but she wanted to work on both of them, or at least one of them. And she chose Chaz, and she gave me the Betty White project. Awesome. And, and I, I flew out on, on one day, spent the night, worked with them the next day, flew back that night. It was the, um, it was oh. the best. It was, she was amazing. That's she was cool. driven. She was driven there. She was um ninety something <laughs> at that amazing. point. She, she was or ninety or she was driven there by a friend. Um, she was wonderful. We had a little lunch and and then we finished and uh, she was amazing and charming and all and and, and like um, like a month before that I was in L.A. Like two or three weeks before this, no, like a month before this, I, I was um, working with Sugar Ray Leonard. On his biography, Dude. I spent I just spent four days with him. Oh, don't get me into name dropping. We'll be we'll be here all day. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cool. Oh, you so, know, just reading their stories. So we do um, four days in L.A. and it, and it takes a while because because um, um, bright guy, wonderful guy, just wasn't wasn't a big reader. Sure, did four more days. Um, I did remote from New York to finish the project, and then. Like a couple of days after we had finished, he sends me, an, an, un, completely unasked for, a boxing glove sign. What? From by, and I'm like, wow, that's kind of cool. I mean, I don't know. They don't, people don't normally, that's, that's great. I mean, kind of. Yeah, whatever. And so, <laughs> like, I find out, like, the next day, I'm, 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 I'm going out to work with Betty White. And Gareth says, you're going to have her sign a boxing glove? I said, oh, <laughs> even better. I'll, I'll, I went to Williams and Sonoma, and I got a yellow oven mitt. Oh my God! And I said, Betty, would you mind? And I have pictures of her signing it and holding it up, dude. And, and downstairs in my office, I have on either side of the Grammy one case with the boxing glove, one kind of trophy case, and one little thing with it with the signed oven mitt. What is your so life? 
just, a, <laughs> just it's, it's an amazing story yeah why not why not that's so um, cool and Dude. then i ended up going out like a month after that and did work i worked uh, with william shatner doing he had a book about something and uh and and then the next day i was working with bill maher and um i i told um, Shatner, he said, well, I said, I know Bill, say a little, say a little bar for me. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, I, I pitched Shatner the idea that I said, you and Betty White should do like a very funny, like a sex tape. Very funny. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just, you know, just a very casual, like breakfast conversation. And like, you know, yeah, this and that and that and this. And oh yeah. Could you move me on a movie like that way? Like, That's great. Thanks. So and, then, uh, <laughs> and then I, you know, and then, and yeah, I won't, I won't talk about Bill. Bill was great. Bill was amazing. Bill, Bill Shatner, William Shatner was amazing. Dude, you're just traveling across the country, meeting cool people, doing cool things. Yeah. Dude, what's, what is your life? You got to look back on stuff like that and be like, pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, a, a, a lot of it, yes. A lot of it, very cool. And a, a lot of it, yeah. Dude. I, uh, I, I, I made breakfast for, for Kelsey Grammer a few months ago. Did you make scrambled eggs? Yes, I did. Ah, uh, there we go. Yeah, he he uh he was doing um a- Apple was was getting into the um uh, content business right on, as they right are on. doing. They're making TV shows now and all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. And they they want they were they were going to make a few audio books, and so they me my, me and my wife they were doing six or seven, and we did basically um five. They were doing six. We did five. One hasn't been released yet. Um. But she did Sense and Sensibility with uh, Kate Beckinsale and then um, A Secret Garden with Karen oh Gillan. God. You know Karen Gillan? Oh, yeah. Yeah, with her. And then I did um, Time Machine with Kelsey Grammer and Wizard of Oz with um, Titus Burgess. Do you know Titus? Dude. Yeah. How, how do you handle this stuff? <laughs> and then, and then I, I, I had already done a – a Wizard of Oz with Brooke Shields and Paul Rudd. Um, my this God. is my, my second. My this is this is my second one. This is just Tuesday and, for you. And uh, Titus was amazing. It was just amazing. Just you know, and and then, but and then Kelsey and Titus took like <clears throat> we did Wizard of Oz over probably three and a half sessions, I would say, but short, like like four or five hour sessions. Mm-hmm. And Kelsey wanted to do the Time Machine in one day. I want to get it done. He said, I'll do it, but it was one day. And, um, and his paycheck might've been, um, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't a lot about what people, I mean, I know people get paid a lot of money for, for audiobooks uh-huh. occasionally, especially audible was handing out huge amounts of money for celebrities. Sure. Um, and this was that kind of money. Oh uh, boy. Like a four hour book. And he wanted to do it one day. So he wanted to start at 7 a.m. Eight a.m. and he lives his his he they he lives in L.A. but they summer. This is like last August, so they they summer in um up in kind of the Catskills area. There's some very beautiful little towns on the Hudson up from me. Right. And um he drove down at dawn, and um I had said you know find out from his agent what he what he wants for breakfast for well, and for lunch find out what he what he wants for food. Sure. And usually you get like oh just make sure there's a place we can order salad from. And there's some water, whatever, right? You know, and and he had they sent basically his con his writer, his contract writer oh. for it, it said, said you know, it listed you know what he wanted for breakfast and it was kind of eggs and bacon and toast and what kind of bread and you know but but perfectly normal like what you order for breakfast yeah and then some snacks you wanted to have around just in case and then kind of an idea for lunch nothing major but the point is that it's it's very hard and I tried to find like somewhere that would serve breakfast around where the studio was, which is not Times Square, it's Herald Square, which is a little 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 farther south. Mm-hmm. It's hard to find and breakfast doesn't transport well anyway. And I happen true. to cook I happen to cook quite well. And so I said, you know, I'll make I'll, I'll make him breakfast. And so I, I went shopping, bought all the stuff, and um showed up and I made I made Kelsey Grammar breakfast. Dude. He liked it. Oh even then, better. And then we recorded, and he he be finished where we wrapped around four o'clock, I would guess. And the production was amazing, and it's free. It's free on Audible. Go and get it. Dude, it's free. That's so cool. It's, on, it's not free on Audible. It's free on Apple. Pardon me. I love it. I love it. 
I, um, so I'm curious with because you've done how many? Do you know how many audiobooks you've done so far? My guess is like eleven hundred. Oh, my goodness gracious, that is a lot. I don't think I've ever read that many books, and I've read a lot of books, and you've recorded them. That's a lot of time over like so, how many years? Twenty five years. I'm and it, and, and, and and it's and it's uh, it's rich reading. The, you know, the read before me and then and then hearing it read to me and then um, hearing a lot of it again sometimes. Sometimes not hearing it again, hearing little bits of it again for like pickups and stuff. Mm -hmm. But if I'm mixing it, I might hear it a couple times more. Oh, um, man. This stuff, I, I started working for Kobe Bryant's company, Granity, and um, back in, I, I got a, um, a, a LinkedIn message. And I, I, you know, who, who the hell gets LinkedIn messages? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, I actually got like, you know, a woman who I knew, I'd met at Penguin. Um, and uh, contacted me and um, wanted to know if I wanted to do, you know, help, help her in this new company called Granity to produce some audio. Mm -hmm. um, I said, sure, let's talk. And then um, we ended up, um, um, we, we couldn't talk that day, which would have been perfect. I was actually driving up to Rochester for like a four or five hour drive. So we hooked up the following week. And by that time, I, I looked up what Granity was and saw it was, it was this new media company that Kobe Bryant was launching. Uh -huh. And um, it was we had a, we got a conversation, got along amazingly well, and um, talked about the first project coming down the pike, and talked about casting, and and it was just an amazing experience. And um, Felicia Rashad ended up. Um, it's 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 um, it's this world that I mean, Kobe is is as as driven as he is on the basketball court and all the kind of everything, the focus. The discipline, the talent, the, the the brains that go behind what he did on the basketball court, he's putting into his media company. Oh, that's cool. It's all it's all kind of this 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 um this um the vi this vision he has of this entire world. It's all about sports and magic and a lot of a lot of kids stuff involved, but not not kid stuff as well. Um, it's, I mean, I think, I guess the focus, yeah, would be probably YA, young adult is kind of the focus of it. The cool. first book that came out is called Wizenard. Sweet. It's about, um, it's about, um, it's five different books actually put together into one large kind of, the audio book was like 19 hours. Wow. Um, and, uh, Felicia Rashad did the narration. So cool. It was amazing. And, um, and then they got Chris Bowers. Who's um, Kobe knows quite well. Chris did all the music for Green Book. Oh, sweet! And um, he was on when they won the um, Best Picture. He was he was on stage and he was thanked. And he's a genius pianist. He um, he actually doubled in a lot of he he did all the music for Green Book. He doubled in for Marshall Ali's hands sometimes. Oh, cool. He saw him play the piano. He had a knockoff Dr. Shirley style, and. Um, a genius, and I don't, I don't, I don't use the word lightly. But if you, if you go on YouTube, um, Chris Bowers, K R I S Bowers, B O W E R S, um, Duke Ellington Caravan, and you'll see a performance he gave maybe like four years ago when he was in his mid twenties at the American Piano like competition, and you'll see piano playing like you. It will just, it will, it will, it will shock and stun you and just amaze you like oh how how can someone do that yeah. I, I, don't, I don't i don't anyway so he did all the music for um wizard art he composed two and a half hours of original music what which was then recorded over three days by 21 piece orchestra in london good lord that's so cool and um, then it was, it was, he, he mixed it down his own, he mixed the music down. Um, there was a lot of reuse that went on, but in like in the first and, and all the music, pretty much most of that was for the first book. So in the first book of Wizard Artist is um, called Rain, named after one of the characters. It's maybe five hours long mm -hmm. and there's two hours of original music scoring that. Wow. And it's, and, it, and it's orchestral. It sounds incredible. And then there's a lot of reuse and some other original cues written for the rest of it. Um, we're just now finishing the next book in the series called Legacy. Um, the first one was all about basketball, a kid's basketball kind of youth league. 
and this new coach comes, and it turns out he has magic, and he's he's um, his name is um, Rollaby, and he's a wizard. He's one of these kind of magical characters from this world. A lot of life lessons. Um, it's kind of the same ten days of training told by five different of the five different players, but from their point of view, not really Rashomon, more of just kind of you know their their journey through the training. That's every every cool. book has ten. The book has ten chapters. Every um, each chapter another day in the training, and it's uh, it's great. And then the legacy is about a female tennis player named Legacy, um, who kind of discovers her magical powers. And again, it's it's the same world but a different part of the world. Right. And there's another book we're doing after that, and then there's going to be more books next year. And he has a podcasting series. He's he's um, looking at doing an animated series, so like an animated animation studio. Um, Broadway movies. Um, he's he's uh, it's, it's going to be amazing. I love that. And he's kind of steering it, and all very hands on. The um, the first was in our book. It's in the credits actually. Me and it's directed by Kobe Bryant and Kevin Thompson. Oh, that's cool. Because he was there like for the whole time. He's like, man, this and suggestions and things, and it was it was great. Dude. That's really cool. I love when people like invest in stuff like that. Yeah. Like that that stuff's really important long term for kids to have stuff like that, you know. Oh yeah, it's stuff of real quality and just real, you know. I mean and then the book itself is like the, the best possible production of a book you could make. No expense spared. Right. It's the, the same the same kind of, you know, book hard hardcover book version as the audiobook version. Or it's just like, you know, how can we do this as best as we possibly can? Right. Let's do it like this. I love uh, that. Yeah. I love when you find people with layers as well. That like, you know, you know Kobe Bryant is a basketball player, but then you see all this other stuff. And the fact yeah. that it's not like, oh, just do it to do it. It's like, no, he really cares about it as well. And that comes through the product. It's so cool. Exactly. Yeah. Dude. So where did the Red Trunk Project come from? Um, God, this is a story I've been telling a lot recently. Um, I just had a benefit last night for Red Trunk. Right Amazing. on. Um, a, a little bunch of people, some people, a lot of people involved with the project, some others in school, people in the area and across the river in Westchester came over. <clears throat> Richard Kine came and did their little auction. Cool. It was fun. And it's, it, it came, the idea for it came almost like five years ago, June 2014. So I guess, yeah, five years ago. Yep. I was working on an audio book with um, Nicholas Kristoff, the New York Times columnist, had written a book with his wife, Cheryl Wu Dunn, called A Path Appears, about different different charities around the globe and how they started, how they operate, how they raise money, how they spend money, and then different metrics for measuring the efficacy of, of the charity beyond just the usual kind of, you know, $95 or of every 100 goes to overhead, $5 goes to, you know, starving children. Right. There's different ways to measure kind of all that, and um, um, Olivia, the actress Olivia Wilde was doing was reading it, and she had worked with um, Nick before, and um, um, something in the book, like the first day we were recording, something gave me the idea. And this is kind of based also, and there's a lot of stuff that goes into this, but something something that was in the book made me thought think that I wanted to you know just kind of stop whatever I was doing and, and then just go around the world and record. Children in, in um, different areas, like in Africa, Asia, in at need kind of areas, at risk, mm -hmm. record their stories of their lives, just kind of in depth, long form interviews yeah. of future children, and then take these interviews, translate and transcribe them, make them into books with lots of pretty pictures from their area, their village, wherever they are, and then use these books to raise awareness for charities. Um, so cool. And then, and then the next day, Olivia told a story. She had done a lot of work in Haiti. And was in a classroom um, when, um, I guess, in a classroom, I think they were orphans. It doesn't matter. But, um, and the tsunami hit, right, in Asia. Oh, right. Well, the, she, and she was telling the kids about this. And in the middle of the story, the kids jump up to get paper and pen to write notes of sympathy and support for the kids in the tsunami, who were affected by the tsunami. And, and, oh, and, man. And just, you know, I mean, it's it's... It's. I've just now. I've told that story probably a hundred times, and just now I'm finally able to tell it without choking up. Yeah. But 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 the connection between those kids, right? Right. 
I thought, why don't I create, instead of just, you know, creating these books to bring back to kind of privileged, you know, people in the West, why don't I find a way to, for kids to share their cultural experience with each other somehow? That Amazing. was the idea. And um, Nick had came at one point and mentioned it to him. I said, oh, yeah. And he goes, oh, that's a great idea. And then, um, like, a couple months after that, my wife said, like, in August, she said, so that idea you had about that, about that, you know, connecting kids thing, what, what do you, you should do something about that. And she said, you know what, call your friend, our friend, Melissa Carroll at the Ford Foundation. I said, oh, that's a good idea. So I was driving into the city for work, and I called her, and I, and I gave her, it was like a, two, a two-sentence pitch at that point. And she said, oh, that's great. I love that. Come have lunch at the Ford Foundation. So we went and had lunch. And over lunch, we kind of came up with the idea of, well, what if instead of just, you know, just stories, what if there were like with a, like a box or something with like physical artifacts in it? So you open the box and the whole village pops out. I said, oh, my God, I could do like photographs. I could do video. Yeah. Wow. That's a really cool idea. And then I then grew that idea over the course of the next um, two years. I guess probably two years, and I launched the website. Launched um, like three days after Trump's inauguration. I was hoping to launch before, like mm-hmm. an early fall. I don't, I don't I want to be. I don't want to be political at all because a lot of stuff I was working on with Red Trunk. A lot of the kind of cultural connection stuff. Yeah. You know, the, the 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 box idea eventually um, grew into a, a, a trunk, and I wanted it to be the a blue trunk. Because I imagine the logo would be like the like the Earth, like a globe. Oh yeah. But the, the World Health Organization already had a um, a, um, a a blue trunk, which is basically um, their mobile um, field hospital libraries. Oh. Would, wardrobe style, be an entire like everything you would need for a field hospital, every book and manual and whatever, in this in this little trunk. So I said, okay, well, what I I I, I fell on red because red's a cool color. Yeah. And um, I also came up with the acronym, the, re- the R-E-D stands for Respect Every Difference. Oh, I love it. And um, then I launched, I, and I, I got enough, a little bit of money, enough to fly and to take a, you know, a, a videographer and a photographer down to Oaxaca, cool. Mexico, for the, to make the first trunk. And we did that in like the fall of 2016, 17, seven, no, 17, I guess. No, 16. And then um, I got a call. I was I was um, we were in Phoenix, and I was shooting a TV show called Tailgate Toughest Tailgate for CBS Sports and Ford Trucks about tailgating. Uh-huh. And it was a woman from a school in Farmingdale, whom I'd met with, and um, so it was it was a woman saying, "Oh my God, I have to have red trunk in my classrooms. The teachers found you online. You, we actually met at one point. You were here presenting something. So you know." How, how can we make this happen? I said, oh, wow, I, I just, I was just in Oaxaca. Let's, let's, let's make this happen. Yeah. And I'd gone to Oaxaca basically just to kind of for like five days to make, um, to, uh, um, make a demo trunk. I ended up shooting enough video for 10 videos, collected enough artifacts for, I made, I built four trunks. And then we we tested them in schools in yes we in Feb of early 2017. Is that right? Yes, I guess. And then um, uh, that was a year ago, or ish. And then um, that was yeah that was, that was 2018. And then um, yeah it was early 2018. We we tested, and then um, uh, beta tested, and then I raised a little more money made 10 trunks and the pilot test is just finishing now. It's gone amazingly well. And the official launch is next year in schools and on Long Island and across the river and other places around New York. I partnered with a big, um, the Putnam Northern Westchester BOCES, which does curriculum development. And they asked to partner with me. They, they have a curriculum that goes out to 230 school districts around New York state. Dude. Um, we had a big event last night. I got a PR person. She got an article. Um, got um, um, the, the Journal News um, across the river, which came out Monday this week um, digitally. Um, and then, like, the next day I was, I was contacted by people in California, Kansas City, Connecticut. Off we go. Yeah. Front page, um, which was great because, because one, one, of, one of my board members is John Hamm. Oh, love it. And um, he gave a great quote and, and – uh, and, uh, 
they had they were able to put on the front page. So it's John Hamm. Yeah, John Hamm. You know, just just John Hamm. Just John. Hamm. Regular old John Hamm. <laughs> That's so cool, though. I love that. I love, so what's and, been you? Had you done anything like this before? Like no, this one? Uh, no, so how do you no. even? How how? <laughs> um, it's it's just it's it's, it's just in you. Yeah, it's just finding the right people and and finding enough people. I mean, I mean, it, I I haven't raised a ton of money. I'm not. I'm, I don't. I know not. I oh, I know. I know something about raising money now. A little bit, not enough. I'm learning more. Um, no grant writing. It's all just been like personal donations. Sure. Um. Um. Some other some other foundations like doing matching grants. A couple of gifts from people. Um. Ragabone made it made a gift last year. ESPN I think is making a gift this year. That's cool. Um, just a little bit, just kind of enough to keep going. Yeah. Um, and and I and and the trunks will actually generate money in schools next year. Um, I'm actually going to get like today or tomorrow the first. You know, I, I charge a little bit for the pilot program. Mm-hmm. I get a little bit of money from them. That's going to go straight out to people I owe it to. Um, but eventually, eventually it will be self sustaining. There is a model for, you know, having a certain number of trunks in the field operating each trunk, you know, they, cause I charge the, cl- the class that the um, schools get charged right. $200 per trunk for a two week period for one classroom. Mm-hmm. And then it goes to another classroom, another, you know, three fifty or yeah, it's less if it's um, two in a row. Sure. And yeah. um, eventually it'll be self-sustaining. And then, then the idea also is, is to bring, I mean, the, the it'll be self-sustaining in the U S in the West um, but I'll still need philanthropic money to bring trunks. So the idea is not just to bring other cultures here, to bring, but to bring other cultures to other places around the world. So like the, the Oaxaca trunk right now will eventually go to Kenya. I'm going to Kenya in the end of September on a scouting trip. Oh, right? cool. And um, I'm talking to people in China about going to China, making it a, uh, a trunk of Beijing, the culture in Beijing. Now, there's a huge interest in, in, um, in America, a lot of classrooms right now for Mandarin language. Yeah, I bet. Culture. So that will be huge. Talking to people about doing a Native American trunk, about doing an LBGTQ rainbow trunk. Um, right on. I'm talking about doing an ocean health trunk. Ooh, good one. Uh, green trunks on sustainability and um, climate change. That's All kinds so of trunks. Cool. It's a great idea, too, to have like, because kids are really tactile as well. Exactly. Have physical things and visual things as well. That's such a good yeah. idea. How did the how did the first showing go at, the, at those schools? Amazing, amazing. There there was there was a woman. I tried to get her to come last night. She wrote me a note like a week and a half ago. It it, it looked like I had written it. It was it was so kind of you know my like, God oh, the children the change <laughs> this this will be with them their entire lives because the idea behind it is that you're not going to learn about every culture right a trunk but the idea and this is this is like. A, this basic education is that if you can give a kid one deep and immersive experience into one culture, into language and traditions and, and, and faith and clothing and food and everything, what their homes look like, what their toys look like, and you connect it to kids, right? So it has, it has a, a, there's a connection because every trunk comes with the, with the, the Oaxaca trunk comes with the Kids in Oaxaca booklet, right? Uh-huh. And it's all about kids' lives. It's the original idea, which is interviewing kids. It's that, basically. It's their lives. Like, like, what do you have for breakfast? And different kids answering the question. Where, where, where does your food come from? Do you have pets? What's your school look like? What's your favorite class in the school? What, what, what do you do after school? What, is your, what, what, do you, what do you have in your refrigerator? Yeah. And what's your favorite holiday? Um, and then... I interview ten kids and give us some of their different answers, and then a lot of a lot of ton of pictures. So there's a connection with with the kids that that's kind of their, their 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 portal into the culture. And then there's 16 videos attached to it, short little five minute mini doc videos on different subjects. So in in the trunk, there's a um, a pre Hispanic um, turtle flute, and there's a five minute video on that guy who makes those flutes. There's a, a mortar and pestle, and there's a little video on the guy who makes that mortar and pestle. That's so cool. There's a little language one. There's an introductory one. There's two of them on dance. There's one on parades. There's one on, on how to make mole. There's one on how to make um, chocolate, handmade chocolate. And, um, yeah, so all, all those elements. And there's a little VR element to it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, There'll be a big, big online element eventually. Um, I still have to be built where 
there'll be two websites. We one kind of the the parent teacher adult portal where you can learn about Red Trunk or sign up at Red Trunk or find out, you know, whatever. And then there's the portal for kids to go online on their phone or whatever. And um, they can make their own little mini mini trunk themselves. They can take using either photos or video. Like take oh, a picture that's of yourself, cool. take one. And then after getting all the all the parental, you know, signed everything and not giving up their their full name or their address or anything, all the privacy stuff. Right. And then they upload that, and, and if it's photos, it's made into a slideshow, and if it's video, it's made into a little movie. And whatever kid around the world watches that, there'll be chirons in their language to say, hi, I'm whatever, I'm this year's old, I like to do this, I like to do this, this is whatever. Um, yeah. And then they also fill out a little, a little form on likes and dislikes and interests and cultural, like, do you like music? What kind of, what, well, what artists do you like? Okay, what songs do you like? So kids can find kids with similar interests around the world or they just, they just do randomly just kind of and they form clubs they'll be forming little clubs or you know and then the clubs will have like weekly meetups and challenges and they'll have competitions against other groups and they get little points and things they get more points for having the more diversity within their group and uh dude, dude you're like connecting the world and all of our it it's like i think i think back to like some astronauts that have gone up to space and then come back and they said the biggest thing that they brought back was that we're all one. It's like we're still just people in the world. And you're yeah. like connecting that through kids. That's really cool. Thank you. Dude, I'm so into that. And I traveling's good for you. I always tell people like get out of the country, go somewhere else, yes. see all over the like it opens your world perspective and yep. you're like facilitating that at like a really important age, formative years and before. It's like that's so cool. That's like you're making a real difference, and I'm so down with that. No, hopefully, and 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 the, I mean, and most kids, most kids won't travel. It's true. I mean, even 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 you know, I'll go, there, there's a that what percentage of the company has has passports, but they never even use them. It's true. And and most just and and most if they travel, will go to Europe, or Mexico, or the Caribbean, or yep. Hawaii, and or Canada. They won't go to you know, and um. And as our world, you know, it's going to get a lot smaller. Very just true. Because of the globalization and then, you know, kind of mass immigration and migration issues and stuff coming up. Yep. It's important that we, that we never think of other people as the other. 100% and, agreed. And, 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 and throughout here, and, 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 and that the biggest challenge besides maybe global warming right now is, is, is kind of fear of the other. Because through, through history, um, pretty much every war violence, everything is based on kind of prejudice and bigotry. Yep. For the most part. You're right. And if, and if we can just change enough of the hum, hum, you know, humanity's DNA, just a little bit, a little of social DNA, you can change the whole world. I agree. And kids, that's another great idea. Because yeah. kids grow up and then they have these experiences. Like I still remember little performances from like elementary school about changing the battery on my fire detector. And I'm like, you know what? I should be aware of this. So th- that you're getting them here and showing them that they're the same. They're kids yeah. as well, and they live their lives, and it's that's cool, man. Redtrunkproject.org. O-R-G. Yes, redtrunkproject.org. Um, you can, you know, is there a what, donation just, section for that? Oh, God, yes. Good, good, so good, you good. Click good. On it, you'll see a donate thing through pay, PayPal. It's a 501c3. Love it. Just click, click, click donate and, and give thousands of dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Done. Easy. It, where where can people find you online? Um, yeah, look at that. Well, I guess Tom, Thompson Scott Productions Love is it. Our, our, me, my wife's production website. It hasn't been updated for a while. Like it doesn't have the, the Apple stuff. It doesn't have the Granity stuff. The Kobe Kobe stuff um, it doesn't. I mean, it it just just has like like a little sampley thing here and there. It's not really for fans. It's more for you know publishing people to you know to hire us, whatever. Sure, sure. Um, but they can like, see your stuff on Audible, a lot of your productions. Yep, yep. Some is available on CD. Sounds better on CD. Hey, hey. Well, spoken like a true audiophile. Well, dude, this was a this was a really good time. I'm glad we made it work. No tech yeah, problems. Yeah, yeah, Look yeah. at that. We've been on the phone for an hour and a half. We have. So I apologize. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. You've got lots, lots to edit from. That's right. That's right. I mean, dude, I hope you had a good time. I've, I've had a great time. This is great. This is great. I, I need to. I need to get going. I need to get more coffee. Yes. Get more coffee same. halfway through this. Same. Same. <laughs> right. That's All right. right. My friend. 
Be well. You as well, my friend. Talk to you soon. Be safe in Florida. I'll try my best. Bye. Bye. Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it is at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. Let them know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get some sweet gear. Also, I've made a Patreon. So if you'd like to support the show and get access to other exclusive shows... You can now do that at patreon.com slash Jedi Brian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Logan, Victor, and JC. Your support means so, so much, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.